Hello and welcome back. My name is Pastor Jacob Swenson. I am the pastor of two Lutheran churches here in the great state of North Dakota. And I have been your guide for about the last month or so uh, as we've been walking our way through the Lutheran Book of Concord. In order to set us on a good level foundation, we've started with the small catechism, uh, and then now, for a while, we've been in the large catechism, which actually was written first. Luther wrote the large catechism for pastors so that they would know what to teach their parishioners on these important things that, well, every Christian has to know. Last time, we started a new part of the large catechism. We we started the Apostles' Creed, the the catechism, so we're talking about the Lutheran Church here, um, is divided up into, well, what we would call sections or chief parts. So the Ten Commandments is a chief part, the Apostles' Creed is a chief part, the Lord's Prayer is a chief part, baptism, and then the Lord's Supper. And then in the middle there, if you know your catechism, you know in between baptism and the Lord's Supper, there's a section on confession. Um, and that, well, we'll come to that later. I've got some comments about that. Today we are in Article 2 of the Apostles' Creed. So the the Apostles' Creed is divided up into articles 1, 2, and 3, corresponding to the members of the Trinity about which each article speaks. So Article 1 concerns mostly God the Father, or not mostly, but all God the Father Article 2 concerns God the Son, and Article 3 concerns God the Holy Spirit. We're going to pick up today in paragraph 25. If you have your Book of Concord in front of you, go ahead and open that up. Uh, If you're on your phone or on the computer, uh, go to bookofconcord.org. Scroll down on the left side of the page, and you'll find the large catechism and then the Apostles' Creed. Um, This is paragraph 25. I'll give you a second while I drink my cup of coffee in your honor. Depending on what time you guys are listening to this, it might be inappropriate to drink coffee, but I disagree. You can drink coffee all day long. I certainly do. Delicious. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, paragraph 25. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. So that is the the text of the Apostles' Creed that has been passed down through the church for, well, if you're like me, 1,800 years. Luther writes, Here we learn to know the second person of the Godhead. We see what we have from God over and above the temporal goods mentioned before. We see how he has completely poured forth himself and withheld nothing from us. Now this very article is rich and broad, but in order to explain it briefly also and in a childlike way, we shall take up one phrase and sum up the entire article. As we have said, we may learn from this article how we are redeemed. We shall base this on these words, In Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if you are asked, what do you believe in the second article about Jesus Christ? Answer briefly, I believe that Jesus Christ, God's true Son, has become my Lord. But what does it mean to become Lord? It is this. He has redeemed me from sin, from the devil, from death, and from all evil. For before I did not have a lord or king, but was captive under the devil's power, condemned to death, stuck in sin and blindness. For when we have been created by God the Father, 
and had received from him all kinds of good, the devil came and led us into disobedience, sin, death, and all evil. So we fell under God's wrath and displeasure and were doomed to eternal damnation, just as we had merited and deserved. There was no counsel, help, or comfort until this only and eternal Son of God, in his immeasurable goodness, had compassion upon our misery and wretchedness. He came from heaven to help us. So those tyrants and jailers are all expelled now. In their place has come Jesus Christ, Lord of life, righteousness, every blessing, and salvation. He has delivered us poor, lost people from hell's jaws, has won us, has made us free, and has brought us again into the Father's favor and grace. He has taken us as his own property under his shelter and protection, so that he may govern us by his righteousness, wisdom, power, life, and blessedness. Right. So, Luther brings us back to creation here. And he says that the story goes like this. God created all that there is. He created man and put man in the Garden of Eden. Well, then man doubted God's word, disobeyed God, and, and thereby fell into sin. And ever since then, we have been not under God's rule, but under the devil's. Um, now, that doesn't mean that God wasn't still in charge. It just means that we, by nature, instead of looking to God, look to the devil. Uh, we are, by nature, sinful and unclean. We are held under his power and kingdom until Christ claims us as his own. Uh, that's in the baptismal liturgy uh, in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and probably elsewhere as well. But then Luther says, Then came Christ who came down from his eternal throne, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, came down from his throne, took on flesh to die on the cross for us. And through his death and resurrection, he has removed us from the power of the devil and brought us back into fellowship with himself and God the Father. Not with gold or silver or any such thing like that, but with his own precious, holy blood. Paragraph 31. Let this then be the sum of this article. The little word Lord means simply the same as Redeemer. It means the one who has brought us from Satan to God, from death to life, from sin to righteousness, and who preserves us in the same. But all the points that follow in this article serve no other purpose than to explain and express this redemption. They explain how and by whom it was accomplished. They explain how much it cost him and what he spent and risked so that he might win us and bring us under his dominion. It explains that he became man, was conceived and born without sin from the Holy Spirit and from the Virgin Mary, so that he might overcome sin. Further, it explains that he suffered, died, and was buried, so that he might make satisfaction for me and pay what I owe. Not with silver or gold, but with his own precious blood. And he did all this in order to become my Lord. He did none of these things for himself, nor did he have any need for redemption. After that, he rose again from the dead, swallowed up and devoured death, and finally ascended into heaven and assumed the government at the Father's right hand. He did these things so that the devil and all powers must be subject to him and lie at his feet, until finally, at the last day, he will quick completely divide and separate us from the wicked world, the devil, death, sin, and such." To explain all these individual points does not belong to brief sermons for children. That belongs to fuller sermons that extend throughout the entire year. 
especially at those times that are appointed for the purpose of teaching each article at length. For Christ's birth, sufferings, resurrection, ascension, and so on, Luther's talking about uh, the different opportunities that come up through the church year for pastors to preach on specific articles of, of Christ's life. So his birth at Christmas, his sufferings during Lent, his resurrection during Easter, his ascension at Ascension, and so on. Yes, the entire gospel that we preach is based on this point, that we properly understand this article as that upon which our salvation and all our happiness rests. It is so rich and complete that we can never learn it fully. Here ends the second article, and I think we will go, since the third article on the Holy Spirit is going to take us a couple days, we'll get started on it now. Um, if you have any questions about the second article, drop me a line, trinitystjohn at outlook.com, trinitystjohn.com is the website. If Article 1 is about God the Father, about creation, Article 2 is about God the Son, the work of redemption, Article 3 is then about the Holy Spirit and concerning the work of sanctification. Now, that's a word that we're going to get throughout our study, but uh, we'll come back to that later. Paragraph 34. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One of the questions that I sometimes get before we go any further is, uh, if you know the creed, you know that there is some division over uh, the Holy Christian Church or the Holy Catholic Church, right? Um, if we go back to the original languages, uh, it says Catholic, but it does not mean Roman Catholic which is what we all think of when we hear the word Catholic. But but when the Creed was written, the word Catholic just meant, I believe in the the entirety of the Christian Church. I believe in the, in the universal Christian Church, um, that all Christians are part of this Church together. Well, what happened is, over the course of history, the word Catholic became understood as what we would now call the Roman Catholic Church. And in fact, uh, when our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters confess this creed, uh, and this is this is my opinion, so uh, I'll I'll put that proviso there. When our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church confess the creed and they say, "I believe in the Catholic Church," that's what they mean, at least on paper. Uh, and I can pull open my Roman Catholic Catechism right here and I could read it to you, but I won't right now. Uh, that's what they mean. But Luther and if I understand this correctly, Luther was the one who came up with the idea, Holy Christian Church, um, because that's what it originally meant. Uh, one Holy Christian and Apostolic Church. That's, that's what the word Catholic in the original language, that was its connotation. So when we say Christian Church, we're not saying, well, we don't include those Catholics. Uh, if you do believe that, find your pastor or, or find me and we'll talk about that. Um, but that's where the change comes from. That over the course of time, that word Catholic became associated with, you know, the Roman Catholic Church. And and so Luther was like, wait a second, what's, what's the proper understanding here? Okay, let's go back to the text. Paragraph 35. I cannot connect this article as I have said, to anything better than sanctification. Through this article, the Holy Spirit, with his office, is declared and shown. He makes people holy. Therefore, we must take our stand upon the term Holy Spirit, because it is so precise and complete that we cannot find another. For there are many kinds of spirits mentioned in the Holy Scriptures, such as the Spirit of Man, heavenly spirits, and evil spirits. 
but God's Spirit alone is called the Holy Spirit. That is, He who has sanctified and still sanctifies us. For just as the Father is called Creator and the Son is called Redeemer, so the Holy Spirit from His work must be called Sanctifier or One who makes holy. But how is such sanctifying done? Answer. The Son receives dominion by which He wins us through His birth, death, and resurrection, and so on. In a similar way, the Holy Spirit causes our sanctification by the following, the communion of saints or the Christian church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That means He leads us first into His holy congregation and places us in the bosom of the church. Through the church, He preaches to us and brings us to Christ. Now we're going to pause there and I'll, I'll leave you with this closing thought. It's, I'll give you this phrase here. The Holy Spirit causes our sanctification. Right? Now I'm, I'm going to leave that with you and we'll come back to this later. Uh, but in English, uh, the Holy Spirit is holy because he, he makes us holy. We don't make ourselves holy. The Holy Spirit makes us holy and we'll talk about how next time. I'll see you then.